Hi everyone! Welcome again to the Prepper Story Hour, behind the scenes action. I'm sitting here kicking it with Ron. We're going to go over a little of how we do the behind the scenes and how he creates his books. It comes off a of stream of consciousness, but we'll bounce ideas off each other and we come up with great people to put in the book, and this is how it works. I'm like, is that thing on? You know, because we didn't do the three, two, one. You didn't give me a heads up on it. So, mm -hmm. okay, so, so see how hard this is now? <laughs> Since we do behind the scenes anyway, you get to see the behind the scenes of us creating this new format. And doing it on tape, we're just winging it. So, bear with us as we go through this first experience together. Yeah, it's bad enough doing this part of it, but let alone how many editors. Editing programs I play with, you know. Yeah, it's people like, don't which realize one's good, which one's bad, and what is this, and what is that, you know. A lot of the editing programs will change the sentence in a way you don't want it changed. So we try to do it mostly ourselves. We'll go over it three or four times editing before it finally gets published. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. No, you're talking about a book. We we're talking about this. We don't go to this. We're just doing it live. Yeah. Like, this is unedited, okay? So we didn't have to do this three or four times to get this bad, right? Yep. <laughs> All right, so we'll tell them a little bit about Patreon and what it is that we're trying to accomplish here in our uh, narrating of the books and whatnot. And then uh, what we're going to do is talk about how the books are created, a little background on me, a little bit how this whole writing thing is. Uh, because technology changes every day and I'm constantly having to learn something new as I'm teaching y'all something old a little bit, you know, yeah. and get out and mess with it a little bit, you know, I gotta have time to go out there and hunt the woods or something, but uh, we'll talk about that, then we're gonna go into, I've got a book I'm writing, we're trying to get out by Christmas, all right, and uh, we're gonna you're gonna read a little bit of that, and you're gonna explain how the process. So let's just go ahead and let you take it, and I'll jump in where I need to. <laughs> okay, Patreon is this awesome new platform that opened up for anyone, any kind of a creator that wants to share something with the world. And this is what we're doing, and by you paying a dollar, two dollars, whatever your level, you get to let us have the experience and share it with you, and we share knowledge and makes a feeling of community, so we're all going through this process together anyway. Patreon lets us do it. We're doing it all the time anyway, sometimes we struggle, and this way we get to have a regular income and get our creativity out, and you guys get a little fun with the adventure of how it's done. The Patreon is the way creators get paid these days. You see a lot of people, you'll see me post a lot on Facebook and Twitter, etc. Or you'll see your people that you'd like to follow on YouTube saying they're demonetizing us, they're taking away our incomes, they're censoring our messages. You talk about guns, you talk about in, uh, non politically correct things, demonetized, so they don't want to hear our voice. Right. And I talk about a bit of everything, and you get nailed for the darndest things. You know, if I, you know, it's like if I tell you how to clean the chicken, you know, and show it, uh, they're going to go, no, that's gross, demonetized, but they'll show somebody cooking and eating a chicken. I don't feel like figuring out in between things, so we just do it the way we're going to do. When we start out on this platform, I've been thinking about doing a regular YouTube channel for years, but I always just kind of stay behind the scenes and talk to everybody on their channels and whatnot. That used to work for me because everybody advertised, you know, but... Right. Uh, that's and they would say, hey, run on or whatever, and I'd give them something from a supporter, and would they review it, and it worked out real good, but uh, a lot of the channels, they disappear because, one, they get demonetized, why do it anymore? Uh, if you're a prep, there's only so many ways you can purify water, and everybody and their brother's doing it, so they don't do it, or they go, uh, they, they move on to homesteading. Uh, more yeah. self-reliant, which is, you don't get to follow them because everybody else is doing bug out bags wanting to know what the latest, greatest, you know, diesel power rifle or something is, you know. Yeah, those are the 
money preppers. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we just do our own little gig on, on what we do. You know, and this is a, this platform here shows us that we can. What I love listening to you read my story, <laughs> so you can kind of explain a little bit about how. We're going to call us an edit for our two dollar patrons. That's the difference between a dollar and two dollar on our channel. Is a dollar you get to hear her just reading the story, or two dollars you actually get to see how I'm creating it. It might be good for any author out there because I go about all different kind of ways. Yeah, <laughs> and y'all think it's a decent way. Or you want to find out how I get a boat shipped to me from Canada? You, I might tell you, but. I don't think you can do that's that's a wrongism, you know. You have a very good talent for that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not trying to brag or anything, but we get a lot of material that everybody complains. Oh, you got too many commercials in there, you know. I'm like, I got a boat, and I picked the best one I could. And if y'all want a boat, this is why it's good. And this is everything you can do with it, and all the gear you need. And then uh, we have prepper meat and. I give gear away, they support, you know, y'all get some yeah. free stuff or I get you a special discount, so it's it's my way, you know. So every time everybody hollers, oh, this commercial's wrong, I go, okay, I'll be nice, but... You know, I may get not get cool as many stuff. prizes and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, you know. Yeah. So. Ron always shares as much as he can with everyone. We get our gear and everyone else gets to share and it's a big adventure. Oh, and we won't get back to it. Well, I used to send out a bunch of books. We had a lot of channels, uh, YouTube channels, like they used to tell me about a big fan or something like that. And we send them free books. I can put some links below this. I think I will put a few of those in there. Yeah. Uh, it's like, I'm dyslexic, but this is, I love this book. And I mean, it's great advertising for me, but the idea of it was just to, you know, give it to somebody. And it was nice. Uh, I got people approach me on uh, Twitter and whatnot. I sure wish I had the money to buy your books or something. They like to watch my little videos, and nobody yeah. watches videos, by the way. But uh, I like sending them out, but I can't do that anymore. I got too much competition, you know, and money's not flowing like it used to. So now we onwards and upwards and doing other things. Yeah. Maybe getting on this platform will help us get back to that much more giving. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's the best part of it, anything, getting to share and give. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I enjoy that. I mean, I want to holler preppers on the beach again and uh, have everybody come down. We went uh, with uh, Low Bucks Channel for a lot of years. Uh, here and there, I always supply a ton of prizes. Even if I didn't appear, I, I, I send prizes to these prepper meets, or I do the retweet on everybody's stuff. Uh, I do the advertising, the community. I push everybody, you know. But uh, there's not many of us old timers, spoke of, you know, yeah. uh, doing that, you know. And uh, you try to start networking with somebody new, and it's a different generation, different mentality sometimes. A whole sudden, different language sometimes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll, they laugh at me because I don't do one of them, you know, hand phones, and, I, and they go, well, you need one of these. And I, I still don't know what Solar Storm does to that yet, and I'm supposed to be the guru that knows this, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm speculating, I'm thinking, and as soon as I think I got it, they up it, or they got spyware, or they got this, that, the other, and I don't know what happens if a hacker makes one super vibrate on you or something, you know, like everybody's walking around one day, and the hacker goes, oh, everybody's phone's going to vibrate a ring or something. What happens? Well, they're saying they can make them explode in your pocket, too. I don't know, it's bad enough these self-driving cars that were the devil out of me. Oh, Lord. <laughs> so, I mean, we're, we're exploring new realms. It's kind of like my grandfather. He started out on a horse drawn fire engine and saw a man land on the moon. And he said, Well, what am I going to see in my time? Yeah. And um, it's kind of like, you know, uh, if you were a stagecoach maker or a blacksmith, you know, you lose your job along the line. Well, I'm 
everybody's going forward with technology. I'm going backwards trying to remember some of this stuff and <laughs> teach people and a lot of that knowledge has been forgotten or I didn't learn all of it. So I'm exploring backwards at the moment. Well, uh, we need to go backwards in lifestyle and you can integrate the technology and make it useful for you instead of such a time-consuming addiction or everyone's got to post selfies or food mess. We get new mental problems. I mean, you got kids that do nothing but play. Yeah. Uh, warlike games, you know, killing everything, and you don't realize, you know, it's got to be like that's the boy I got to watch if I give him a BB gun, not to shoot the birdies in the backyard because got no respect for real wildlife or what. It desensitizes them. Morals, separates them from reality. integrity, safety, da da da. You know, yeah. and and don't back mouth me. Either respect elders type thing, you know, which they don't do these days. I sure don't. And, uh, I mean, I come from the hip here. We were like all against establishment. Now we're like <laughs> being old folks, you know. It's like my father built there in the cemetery. And when I was there, I was talking to this old sergeant. I said, you know, when they put the last uh, World War II generation, the greatest generation, which y'all did, in this cemetery, we're going to go to hell in a handbasket because you're the ones that set up the government, the fought for the country, all this and that, and you know, we had to do it now. And it's like everybody kind of mellowed from that. It took a long time to mellow that generation a little yeah. bit. And there's still a lot of y'all out here I ain't talking about you. I'm just saying, hey, used to be, you know, you'd chase a hippie down the street type thing because I know how to go you know, <laughs> bad deal in the red, but I don't want one of those haircuts, but uh, it's still what the, the basics of the 50s generation, the leave the beaver thing. We actually had a really good look at what goes on out here now, you know. Yeah, they brought civilization. Yeah, basically. Kept it. Okay, so uh, we're going to quit digressing here and go back to... Uh, how we make a book, actually. We'll be starting out reading a portion of one he's working on right now. I haven't even read it yet, so this is my first time, too. Smoking Skillet. You okay, gotta... basically what I, I do is, like, if Pat lives uh, a distance from me, and we don't always hook up, she's got her house, I got Prepper Shack, and I also take care of my mom, which is an opposite direction. And I'm constantly floating back and forth, going here and there. And it's, originally, I was going to call it backwards bug out, and we were going to do it a different <laughs> way, right? Yeah. Which, I mean, how many places do I have to bug out, you know, or collect people from? It's, it was kind of a unique situation. I know a lot of people probably experiencing the same. But uh, this one is a deviation from what I got. And uh, y'all that are against commercials, guess what? This one don't have one. <laughs> it just be writing. How about that? <laughs> Merry Christmas to wow. y'all. That's your present, right? <laughs> yeah. A Ron Foster book without commercials. Isn't that fun? Everyone's going to be flabbergasted. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh. Did you want to say something about the name? Oh, The Smoker's Skill? Well, the name of the book, you'll find out. And I explain it to you as she edits here. So I'll write a story and then she's like, what are you doing? I say, oh, it's cool. Or I'll tell her a bitter piece on the phone or something. Then she finally gets to come down here and I'll say, well, would you read it to me? And then as I hear it, I'll add to it or whatever. And then uh, we call that the no edit process because like read the story, you can't stop and fix things yet, you know? And that's why she got to get pretty good at the way I write, you know, without periods and commas and such. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, the world's longest sentence. So and it'll break it down <laughs> later, but when I'm writing, I got to write that way. And then when I want to hear it, I got to hear it that way. And then we go back and we do it. And then I'll, I can be watching TV and hear something. I'm like, cool. And I'll start a little bit. And I just leave that sitting in the middle of something and just start reading. I'll go, oh, that don't go with that. I'm just going to move it there later some other part of the story or something, you know. And then I'll put the thing down for a week sometimes and come back and it's new to me. And I, I forget my own character's names. <laughs> you know, who was that? Then we have to scroll back up and find out. 
Yeah. Or <coughs> coming off of another book, you know. After so many books and being so prolific with so many different characters' names, it's hard to keep track. Yeah. So, uh, basically what we're going to do is we're just going to let her start reading off the story. And I'll interject or I'll sit over here and be quiet and we'll figure it out. And uh, this is kind of your intro to the $2 Patreon thing if you all like it. All right, here we oh, go. Oh, wait a minute. I want to talk about $5 we've got. I want a truffle dog. <laughs> yes, truffle dog. Truffle dog's cool. I didn't know we had truffles in Alabama pecan groves, or even in the southeast for that matter. So this was really fascinating looking into the subject and which breeds of dogs are good for sniffing them out. So I, I know about blue tick cows, bloodhounds, black and tans, this, that, the other thing. And I, I used to own an old South Herb company and collect botanicals or get pulp winters to help us. We don't have uh, slaves in the South now. We have what they call pulp winters, as they say sometimes. And that's a, usually a black crew, and you start out on a pulp wood truck about nine years old. And that's a 1952 held together with bell and wire or whatever. You go out here and you cut wood, you know, and you end up with arms like this. Yeah, <laughs> they're huge, and they can lift anything. <laughs> yeah, but they're the best kindest people there ever is. But, you know, my old place, you know, they, uh, they got a problem with white folks. They go get whoever local them. We just do. We live together, you know. That's everybody thinks about Preston South. We just we got our own little gig, especially when you get back backwards, like where I come from a little bit. Yeah, we don't have any race riots down here. We get along together. Oh yeah, and he stop and help me the same as I stop help him on the side of the road. You know, he'll go. Yeah. If you stop on the side of the road in New York City, they come and rob you. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's different to me anyway. But. Uh, The books, the the old weird southern lifestyle I write in is all about just working together as a community. You know, I kind of lost my train of thought where I was going there with that. I got on the rant. Simply but, creative. Yeah, we're just creating. So then uh, we'll go on with this book. I want to talk about what was currently happening in the world. So we're going to talk about Korea and. Also, while we were talking about the triple dog thing, the, uh, I'm not going to write nine mile for records. You know, I'm, I'm going to run out of stuff just like everybody did on preparedness. I'm going to teach everything I got. And I'm like, shall it my goal and see the world, you know? <laughs> and uh, then you can watch me and you wander around and be sitting in the pecan grove and the dog be buying some stuff and we're going to still get by. Maybe you want to, too. That's the coolest job I can think of. So, since I got you on the road to prep with what I might find you a, a neat little retirement job or something, and we're going to go through this together. Sounds good. All right. So, why don't you go ahead and start the story, and here we go. Smoking Skillet. Preface. If man can water, modify the weather, he will obviously modify it for military purposes. It is no coincidence that the U.S. Army, Navy, Air Force, and Signal Corps have been deeply involved in weather, weather modification research and development. Weather is a weapon, and the general who has control over the weather is in control of an opponent less, less well armed. The idea of clobbering an enemy with a blizzard, or starving him with an artificial drought, still sounds like science fiction. But so did talk of atom bombs before 1945. So wrote author Daniel S. Hallisey Jr. in his book The Weather Chan Changers, published in 1968. So what I talk about is nothing new. I just tell you things that you had heard of and then tell you how common it was. And I've been studying it for that long. Yeah, people don't realize a lot of this stuff started long ago. And people have just forgotten it, or they don't teach you it because it's not in line with their agenda anymore. Well, it's like old Pete, he hangs out on my channel, he's doing his one line or two But we did uh, emergency management together on master's level. We were teaching EMP and whatnot in the sidebar in Solar Storm because they told us we weren't allowed to talk about it in school for an emergency management master's degree. 
So we basically taught the whole darn class what it was, and the instructor had to stay out of it. That's hard to believe. You know, but that's what it is. So, I mean, I'm in there, I got two masters. degrees. I should have had a doctor, but I just didn't do the colloquial stupid thing. And <laughs> uh, they don't teach it. And there's not one class that you take in college in emergency management at any level. That tells you how to purify water. So y'all lower your oh opinion God. of who's in charge of you one time. Yep. People just blindly trust the government. And no emergency management yeah. is, you know, you're you're more of a switchboard operator. You know the the what cop to call to send where where hazmat is or whatever, and that's it. As for Getting around or eating roots and herbs and all that kind of stuff like I do, it's not taught at all. That's amazing. You know, and they, they, everybody looks up to me, you know, they, if you stand there on the uh, flooded street and whatnot, what do we do? Uh, get in the boat, is <laughs> all I can say, because they don't know anything else. I and mean, then... Uh, I wrote Art Storm where they had to go pick up all the emergency managers that got flooded in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Didn't know what to do. There you go. And you told me that most emergency managers don't even have a 72 hour kit. Oh, they don't? Yeah. And they thought it was amazing. It's like, you know, 10 years after the prep movement, they do it. Oh, that's the only reason I got. I post my emergency management stuff on my Facebook all the time because I still get all my newspapers and all that kind of thing. You know? yeah. and I'm a certified emergency manager. I mean, that's nationwide. I got more crap than most of them got in my state, you know. And they go, okay, let's look at this. They start comparing what preppers do, you know. So I'm always watching them, but, you know, and everybody's par paranoid prepper community, like, oh, they're going to take this stuff. They ain't no plants. They didn't know plants take care of themselves. Y'all quit worrying about that. Yeah. You know. <laughs> but I write my books I got by over there because, like, we were in Mobile. Quick little story for you. Hurricane Frederick um, down there. And that's when I learned to hang out at the cop shop. I was in the National Guard then. And there's an art to being in the National Guard going to hurricanes and floods and whatnot. Because you got uh, various tents set up where to eat chow at. Now, you don't want to go over to like Salvation Army. Because mm -hmm. whoever's working the Salvation Army was properly in there, and they ain't the best folks around to have cooking your food sometimes. <laughs> right? Yep. <laughs> but that's all they got, that's who's cooking. And uh, everybody that didn't prepare, don't have stuff at home, they're out there eating. It's amazing how the tents fill up, and it's amazing how many homeless people you got that come in. Yeah. Everywhere that used to go in to getting food out the back of a restaurant, all kind of weird stuff, you know, that y'all don't think about. So anyway, you hang out at the cop shop is what you do. It's the police station. Police are nice folks during things like this. They don't go crazy unless you're in New Orleans. Now, I'll talk about that later. But, oh. but down here in Mobile, Alabama, that's cool myself because all the families are carrying, it's like potluck dinners down there. There's more food than they can eat. The, all the, uh, anything that's freezing, supermarkets, whatever, they donate food. We got all the canned goods, everything. Awesome. And then, uh, like, well, the side of the Coors building, Coors Light, mm -hmm. blew off. And they said, well, you all can take some down there and whatnot. I just, I know I can't pay you all the guard and whatnot, but if you drive around a little bit, I'd appreciate it. That's how you talk to somebody. So it was free beer, too, and I'm like, <laughs> I got this. <laughs> and so from now on, I wrote one of my books. I go to the cop shop, and then if you hang out with them, you get pulled over. Oh, yeah, you're the guy. Yeah, I mean, the National Guard police for a while. Yep. I couldn't get a speed ticket or nothing. It was cool. <laughs> you know? Get on their good side. Oh, yeah. No, they're, they're good human beings. And, and like I say, you see the best of everybody during yeah. that time. But, you know, as a first responder, you got to look at things differently, too, you know. And then it's also, if you're a prepper, what do I do? And what do I observe? And how do I think outside? Do I want to interview? What is this? And you got all these people that come uh, to a 
relief effort, if you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And they all got together, and might, some of them, especially contracts, might not have uh, your good intentions in mind either. You know? All right, go ahead and read the story. I'm sorry. <laughs> Winning the war without direct conflict. The headlines had been reading for months the same basic rhetoric, North Korea, Trump and Kim call each other mad. Kim Jong-un had said remarks by the deranged U.S. President Donald, Donald Trump have convinced him he is right to develop weapons for North Korea. That was the whole ticket because Rocket Boy was brandishing the biggest gun he had allegedly because he was in fear of an invasion by South Korea and the U.S. In other words, his line in the sand was to go nuclear if we did anything to his, him militarily, and he was going to hide behind the substantial threat and hurl insult, insults and provocations at the world, supposedly behind this safe cover that the world was afraid of his nuclear retaliation. In Kim's eyes, he needed nukes to stay in power and be left alone in his hermit kingdom, and there was a little something to that. Mr. Trump responded that the North Korean madman will be tested like never before. That threat was made before that bastard Kim started making up his own questions and putting America itself to the test, Questions that the Hermit Kingdom's leader knew that the U.S. was most likely unprepared to handle. A whole bunch of clever little terrorist pop quizzes was devised by Kim's army in the form of guerrilla tactics designed to add fuel to the fire and upset America's apple cart, while denying any fault or guilt of North Korea. Kim Jong-un was secretly preparing for a major Category 1 cyber attack, as payback for sanctions on his country, among other things. In comparisons, the WannaCry ransomware virus attack he had unleashed that had already hit the British government badly was only considered as Category 3 or 4 cyber event, and this time he had more than getting money for his war chest in his sights. He would claim no credit for the next cyber attack, just as he had denied the last, and profit mighty, he thought. China, as usual, didn't say shit about their troublesome neighbors threatening antics towards the world, but made a statement. China responded to the war of escalating threats and retaliatory words, warning that the situation was complicated and sensitive, and that America should be diplomatic. Russia also urged restraint, with Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov describing the rhetoric between the two leaders as a kindergarten fight between children, but like a belligerent classmate, they in China relished the thought of egging things on in their own way from the outer circle of a possible fight as instigating observers. North Korea had been testing missiles recently at an unprecedented rate, and has already conducted its sixth nuclear test despite international condemnation. North Korea has already had about every sanction imaginable imposed on it, and the country lacked the power to impose any political revenge on others until its military could hatch a diabolical plan. North Korea threatened, roared, and saber-rattled as, as its leader tried to bluff its way out of the corner they had backed themselves into. The plan North Korea had come up with was somewhat simple on its surface. It would impose its own misery and financial woes on other countries that had imposed their wills upon it with sanctions. But it would be very subtle about it at first, and hide behind layers of plausible deniability while it played its chaotic games. Instead of just a simmering pot waiting to boil over, it would turn up the heat and leave a smoking skillet on the burner waiting to erupt in fire at the slightest flashpoint. That's where the name of the book comes from. Yep. A good name. America was already embroiled in conflicts and various disputes worldwide, distracting its war-weary citizens. Saran so thought this was a good time to take a page out of Korea's playbook and start testing its own missiles and advertising its nuclear intentions. The Trump administration was due to announce the details of its strategy vis-a-vis -vis Iran around the end of September, but knowing that he, being a strong president, probably wasn't going to give in to demands like the lily-livered Obama, they decided to go back to threatening and awaiting the, awaited the sanctions so they could go do business openly with North Korea. Iran could plot and scheme on the demise of the great Satan while using proxy henchmen Korea and the hundreds of terrorist groups they already funded in the Middle East and elsewhere. Pause for a second on that. I just wanted to mention too, uh, and you've heard me say this a hundred times, I said, I gotta watch whatever I had in here because, like, I started doing this months ago, but I know a lot what goes on emergency wise or people wise but it's like predictable whatever i write in that book is what is happening or going to happen yeah it's like when i wrote prepper's road march that come out right after uh one second after and what it would have taken uh 
two years. Uh, a lot of people like uh, Off Grid Magazine did a piece on me too. Uh, everybody started saying what I predicted in my book, and, I, and that's why the book still says 2012 on the thing. Yeah. That we missed it, you know, by a week. We would have been out, but I, I've been the whole time stockpiling the house, warning against this and that, and even preppers didn't know solar storms. It was, it was new. Everybody knows yeah. it now, but it was totally new then. They were worried about other stuff, you know? Yeah. But that was my gig, and it's still my gig, you know? Yeah, it's still amazing how close we were to total. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, but every time I put something in the book, you know, yeah, I keep years. telling you, be careful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we don't want it too bad. <laughs> and I'll say, ah, this and that. And he'll say, don't write that down because it happens, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Go ahead, I'm sorry. North Korea's foreign minister set the ultimate game ball in play for a cosmic confrontation when he reported that the nation may set off the most powerful hydrogen bomb detonation ever in the Pacific. <clears throat> Excuse me. No other details were provided, like yield. But at face value, everyone assumed such a blast would be a thousand times as powerful as the Hiroshima bombing. Chinese intelligence was now saying they thought North Korea may have as many as 40 to 60 nuclear devices of various explosive powers, as Russia reminded the U.S. that two of their generals had already warned that the Russian plans for a super EMP weapon had already somehow found their way into Kim Jong-un's hands. The North Korean had just taken this war of words up to a whole different level of threat. North Korea has set off several powerful nuclear test blasts in recent years, but they all occurred deep inside a mountain. A nuclear explosion in the air, on the ground, underwater, or in space has not happened in decades, and international treaties are in place to hopefully never allow this to happen again. America knew if North Korea sets off an above-ground nuclear explosion, and the most powerful one ever detonated in the Pacific, the Cold War's rich history of America's and Russia's test blasts suggests what might surely happen. The Pentagon knew that class was officially in session for real now, and scrambled its resources to come up with an answer as to what America would do if such a thing occurred. If North Korea detonated a nuclear device 200 kilometers above the Earth in order to create an electromagnetic pulse, would the U.S. counter-strike North Korea with conventional and perhaps even multiple nuclear weapons? The problem with nuclear test explosions is that is that they create radioactive fallout. Space detonations come with their own risks, including a more widespread electromagnetic pulse. Now, Kim Jong-un knew an EMP attack over or near U.S., Japanese, or South Korean territory is a physical attack that would wreak havoc with communications, the power grid, and civilian physical intra infrastructure. Okay, my tongue is getting dyslexic, sorry. I'm sorry, but I want to listen to this part, too. Because, see, right now, everybody's watching the news. Yeah. I'm writing it down for you. You know, I don't talk real open out there in the books, Facebooks, you know, social media and whatnot. That's being monitored through keyword filters and whatnot. I put stuff in my books. And yeah, my dinger goes <laughs> off on, on the AOL. Well, this is live, so y'all hang with it. Anyway. I'm explaining to you, in the best way I can, with a little bit of knowledge here, what is actually going to go on and how everybody's thinking, you know? Uh, well, you give them, you know, North Korea voice and, or this and that. I'm not taking side. My job is to know my enemy. What's yeah. he thinking, how he represents what you think. So, Militarily, if they pop one off in the Pacific, say, they're not a member of the nuclear factor, sovereign country, and they're going to say, well, you did it a bunch of times. Why can't we do it? Yeah. Type thing. And then we're in a position that, well, you don't want to have missiles, but that's an act of war. I'm trying yeah, to explain it. Even though it's off over the Pacific, all that fallout's going to come directly to the United States. Not necessarily. It's not the fallout so much. See, uh, the world is a financial situation. 
you mess with one yeah. freighter, you're doing maritime law. We got to come up with all these things that we can talk about. But anyway, I think I wrote the coolest book right here, and hopefully I don't have nobody chase me down. Uh, we used to do what they call red team. You put yourself in the position of the terrorist of the other army, and this is uh, what we do all the time, military and anything else. And I said, I can do whatever the hell I want if I was that dictator without firing a shot. And here's his playbook. This is what he's doing. Like if I was your military advisor. Yep. And how would I do it? And I think by the end of this chapter, you can go, holy hell, I hope that don't happen, Ron. That's why I said previously, yeah. because I have it in my, my version a little bit perfect. I didn't go to a lot of things that I know I didn't put in there, mm -hmm. but I put in, if y'all just read this part, you go, you see how easy this is? And it's not what you're thinking. It's, this is what he's doing. Yeah. And nothing's is going to happen. We're going to get whacked. And then, but and go, keep going here. I just oh. want everybody to understand that a little bit because I, I'm really proud of this one. The problem with nuclear test explosions is that they create radioactive fallout. Space detonations come with their own risks, including a more widespread electromagnetic pulse. Now, Kim Jong-un knew that an EMP attack over or near U.S., Japanese, or South Korean territory is a physical attack that would wreak havoc with communications, the power grid, and civilian physical infrastructure, and get massive retaliation. He wasn't going to do anything as foolish as that. He didn't have to. Just the threat and demonstrated capability might get the desired responses. However, in his mind, if America could test its nuclear weapons over the remote Pacific, then why couldn't he? Why couldn't he do it way away from the main countries and as a demonstration of his country's superpower? His advisors explained timidly to him that atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons can lead to multiple dangerous scenarios and pushed their thoughts about using plans from Russia's Cold War playbook to seek his status and revenge. They asked their great leader to resemble to remember that Soviet Premier Khrushchev had said, we will take America without firing a shot. We do not have to invade the U.S. We will destroy you from within. It was quite dangerous for his military advisors to try to sway Kim Jong-un's mind away from anything but his newly found knowledge of this great EMP weapon, but this quote helped them to settle him on another idea to bring America to his knees, for now, as they develop bigger, stronger weapons. This coaxing him to seek other venues and schemes, they hoped, took the risk out of they themselves getting nuked to oblivion in return for pushing America too far should the psychotic leader get his way. A war of attrition was already going on everywhere at a scale unimaginable at every level and included all nations. When people have nothing to lose, they oftentimes lose it. Kim had everything to lose if he miscalculated America's resolve. As long as he didn't cause an international incident that caused America to use its first strike or second strike conventional or nuclear capabilities, he was in his megalomaniac megalomaniac mind winning on all fronts, regardless of his nation's multitude of starving, suffering people. If his followers were starving from economic and trade sanctions, then the opposing nations should suffer the same in return, he decided, before he would ultimately destroy them. He could, with the resources he already had on hand, unleash cybergeddon and cause trillion-dollar losses, infrastructure collapse, societal breakdown on those governments... Yep on those governments that currently opposed him. They would feel the financial sorrows and hunger pains his f people felt, he decided. Kim Jong-un didn't have a lack of imagination or advice when it came to achieving that task. It was rather simple, really, and the Americans had already provided him and everyone else on the dark net with lots of cyber warfare tools to mess up the world's financial markets and get paid to do it. The UN banking sanctions weren't hurting North Korea much, except on the surface, and the murky normal channels of world finance. The WannaCry ransomware attack was his first act of implementing his nefarious plans against the U.S. and its allies. On May 2017, a worldwide cyber attack by the WannaCry ransomware crypto worm, which targeted computers running the Microsoft Windows operating system, 
by encrypting data and demanding ransom payments to the Bitcoin cryptocurrency was executed. Lots of people considered that one has to suspect this was a big false flag ploy by the U.S. government, led by the SEC and other concerned parties, elite parties, to discredit Bitcoin by association. The ransom dem is demanded in Bitcoin, after all. The public just assumed it was asked to pay this way because it was supposedly untraceable. Now China, at the same time, was mucking up the markets, coming up with its own new currency one that was gold-backed and was going to be used to replace the petrodollar for purchases. Saddam Hussein thought about that, and you know what happened to him when the industrialists and elitists decided they couldn't have that happen. The accusations that China and Russia are hacking the world and focusing on the USA were everywhere in the news, and with Iran and a number of others pissed off Middle East Eastern nations and terrorist groups all trying their hands at hacking, this push of cyber war for money and power on the internet as battleground, one might consider this war would go on forever with no clear enemy of the state being directly punished. Yes, earlier on I said that Bitcoin was chosen for payment of the ransom because it is supposedly easy to set up, and it's technically anonymous. But those in the community all know this isn't true, and all Bitcoin transactions leave a trail. Kim Jong-un knew this fact, but since the whole hacking community had the same program and capability he had, deniability to having caused all the damage, and indeed it was used by several individuals and proxies as well as state-sponsored groups to get on this cash cow. If Bitcoin was discredited or could be traced to NK, it was only a mythical digital number to him and no real loss of wealth. In the meantime, his country still made money as long as people accepted it for rice imports, etc., if need be, he could hack or EMP the whole thing, and the world would spiral into financial collapse and be as poor as he was, Kim figured. Mess with him now? How dare they? He would have his just revenge, and they would pay tribute, the ruler thought. The malware attack paralyzed computers in factories, banks, government agencies, and transport systems, hitting 200,000 victims in more than 150 countries. The U.S. couldn't say it was a state-sponsored act directed by N.K. The U.S. National Security Agency believes, with moderate conference, confidence, that the ransomware called WannaCry came from hackers sponsored by North Korea's spy agency. Notice they said sponsored by and not committed by. Hell, there are hackers for hire worldwide in the Middle East as well as Russia, China, etc. all have their own as well as state-sponsored cyber warfare and intelligence gathering agencies the same as the U.S. as well as their rogue agents. The WannaCry malware relied on leaked NSA code, so it doesn't entirely prove North Korea's hacking acumen or program creation either. However, the country has repeatedly been involved in major hacking incidents over the past few years. In the U.S., most notably, it was said to be responsible for the 2014 breach of Sony Pictures, and the NSA says it was linked last year to several thefts from banks throughout Asia to raise funds. Electronic bank robbery is nothing new these days. Messing with a country's infrastructure instead of just hacking in to gain intelligence is a different matter. Kim Jong-un's cyber war games continue to escalate in complexity and effects. His operatives continue to hit infrastructure targets around the globe, practicing for the day when full-scale cyber warfare is declared. When the National Security Agency lost control of the software behind the WannaCry cyber attack, it was like the U.S. military having some of its Tomahawk missiles stolen, Microsoft President Brad Smith said. Everybody heard about this fiasco for about a week, and then things went quite quiet. Did we false flag ourselves? Who knows, really? Cyber warfare isn't the only way to mess with digital data. I'd be willing never to tell you. Yep, some of those secrets you don't tell. <laughs> The internet is full of plans to create devices made from stuff that you can buy from a hardware store and disable computers at varying range depending on size. There are plans for small EMP pulse generators to cause even more damage, as well as the principles and lists of necessary materials to make EMP bombs that use conventional munitions and can take out a city's infrastructure. The electromagnetic anti-drone rifles the North Koreans had already developed and fielded were basically a GPS neutralizing device. You that know about those? No, I hadn't. A lot of people don't see. I always teach you history, latest weaponry, this, that, the other, and then everybody's going, they got rifles to point at our drones? It's that easy, people. You know, 
if we got one thing, they got another thing. Yeah, and they're way ahead of anything we know about. Well, anyway, I'm just clicking on whether you call them backwoods hermit kingdom. Like, they got EMP rifles. Wait a minute, I ain't heard about are they having EMP rifles? Yep. So, I'm just telling y'all as I go a little bit of something here. Knowing we've got it already, they just well, don't talk about it. Well, when you get down here, I'm going to say break, and we got about another 10, 15 minutes to go, and then we're going to have a short discussion to end this up. Ask me if what I come up with scared hell out of you, because you ain't read this one yet, but so far I'm just like babbled away, and so far I ain't said nothing about no weather wars, no nothing. I'm just saying, uh, huh, this is happening. See, everybody that's reading this book now kind of wants to know this. As I write, I also watch uh, what's going on right now. So, I put in there, they got 60. And I know everybody do the fact check when we run out there. They might have 60 nuclear bombs. And then everybody said a year ago, they don't have one. Now they said they got 60. China says they got 60. Russia says... They got super EMP weapons. They had it for years. Uh, they're the biggest cyber attackers out here. I got them combined with Iran. Iran wants to be like it. I like, do y'all see the real picture here? And as I'm telling, just like I was doing the Soul Storm with Miss by a week, I'm telling you what's going on. And watching, but I'm going to write this one as we see more stuff coming out. Yeah. And then they're going to go, Oh, yeah, I just heard about last week, so that's why I always got to get my latest book. Now, you want to learn old skills, read my old books, but I think my style is going to speed up a little bit. That's why I'm starting to give more tricks that I didn't used to tell you. That was, or is that, we had a conversation yeah. about that. Like, it's like pulling a tooth. <laughs> oh, man, that's my cool trick. I don't want everybody to survive the way I want to, you know. <laughs> but, no, I'm going to go ahead and tell everything, you know. And uh, as this stuff escalates, I think I got to get out quicker and quicker, you know. Yeah, that's and, and I'll be a really right. wrong person to hold anything back now. I'm older and I'm like, ah, oh, here, I just tell you everything, you know. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to get out here as quick as I can, you know. Yeah, it feels like everything's coming to a head. Well, time to get done with that. I don't know. You tell me what you feel like when. Watch what I just wrote off the top of my head. You know, that took me, what, uh, two, three days to write that, something? And that's without uh, me putting the uh, little uh, <laughs> airborne on it or something. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. You know so much about everything in the... It's like watching a three-dimensional chess game. You remember history and, you know, the military process and... You can almost predict what steps are going to be taken next. Because I know, I know you see what I the would overview. do in response to that. Like, I mean, I don't talk about my education much, but it's like studying war history. Patton was the best one. He, he knew, yeah. uh, you know, Hannibal's movement. Uh, you know, you, you study uh, China, the art of war. Uh, you study uh, things that uh, tell you great truths, you know. Yeah. Patton was a great man. Our government sure messed him up. Well, he aspired too high. But when you're doing survival, you have to aspire at the lowest. It's like my last two books that I, I did out there, and I said, uh, my quote, you know, if, if a, you don't know how to catch a bird, you're reduced to eat what birds eat which is worms and bugs. Yeah. And I'm trying to keep y'all from eating worms and bugs. Y'all got to listen to me a little bit. And everybody's like, I'm going to get this and that for barter and trade. I said, you don't know how to talk to somebody. Are you not used to somebody? Like, I'm used to... Everybody walk up down the street, you know, hunting season with a shotgun or something. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? And they're not no mad terrorist in New York. You know, this is a country boy with a shotgun. And yeah. Of course, uh, New York is a country boy with shotguns. I don't know how that ends up, but anyway. 
He does accept it, but if you're going to be a society where everybody walking around with guns and they've been in the military not used to that, you're not on a range or a fire line, you're meeting strangers with guns. Yeah. If you got the mentality of video games where you all both start shooting at each other or somebody going to snipe you when you walk out the door because you can't get along with your neighbor or something like that, or you ever threaten somebody with a gun that could be laying in the bushes for you, so you better be thinking about that, you know. Yeah. That's why I'm going on vacation to Florida, catch crabs on the <laughs> kayak. All right. Have you found your place? Yep. All right. Here we go. The elect electromagnetic anti-drone rifles the North Koreans had already developed and fielded were basically a GPS neutralizing device that also shuts down all Wi-Fi, 3G, and LTE signals within a radius of one kilometer of its electromagnetic beam, which is invisible to the human eye. You can create a lot of mayhem with such toys depending on what it was you were trying to accomplish and what you were aiming at. At the very least, you can confuse any first responder's communications and by shutting down traffic lights, create massive gridlock for a short period of time to allow you to escape to do more sabotage. The next crash will spell the end of banking in its current form. The chief of U.S. Cyber Command has said it's a matter of when, not if, the U.S. power grid is hit by cyber attackers, and a recent high-profile attack that shut down power in the Ukraine showed it's certainly possible and feasible with infrastructure targets. The goal of a cyber attack like that against the United States infrastructure from a nation state is going to be not just to turn the power off, but to keep it off for an extended period of time, impacting millions and millions of people. If you add physical attacks on the grid with explosives, EMP weapons, sniper fire, etc., you can accomplish this goal rather easily and efficiently. Destroy. You know, I'm, you know what I'm going to do with this? I'm going to put it up here. I'm going to put a little title on it. Maybe. I know I'm talking out of school here, but I, I just had an idea. I mean, should tell you, when I get ideas, they usually generally work. YouTube says, okay, you got to have 10,000 views, 1,000 or whatever. Damn it, if you want to monetize. Like I said, I got a very tiny channel, less than 100 or something, because I don't want to talk. I'm going to put this out with one of them clickbait things like uh, Korea for Preppers on it. Get this thing monetized on the side so we can get the word out better to the preppers and whatnot. Probably get in trouble, get a knock on my door for telling them how to do it. But we'll get it moving here. Get the money flowing and get people realizing stuff. You know, because like I talked about the rifle, again, back to the rifle. Yeah. You can make that out of Radio Shack, hire a hardware. And you turn off all of the street lights, and you do you can do some major crap. And I don't I don't like talking about that kind of stuff, but I'm saying this is how easy it is, people. Yep. So we can. And it's also prepared. if you're prepping, it's how easy it is to mess up your plans. So you prepare, move, lose everything but your mind, and then we got to wait for the dust to settle. So you prep, you stay in your house, best you can. And wait for stuff settled. Don't be heading in front of woods doing no crazy stuff. Just stay where you at. You know? Yeah. Sit it out. And if you can sit it out, and I told the last two, but like I said, ah, I'm going to eat some little birdies in the backyard and whatnot. I'll be just fine. Make me think of that old funny damn uh, doomsday pepper song, you know, or the field mice and the rice. Well, <laughs> But this is how easy it can be done. And I'm not even going anywhere with it. I'm just like basic walk through mess with you that nobody thinks of. And everybody going, well, are you telling all the people out there? They already know all this. You don't know all this, so I'm telling you how I do it. You know? I can do it this way. I put in a story form for you. And here, check it out. I know I'm messing up the mystery, but I might as well talk. I think I will do that. Uh, I'll throw it over on YouTube. Let's sit there and see if we get some clicks. I got to get some following. We need some patrons. If you keep wanting this information, it's a buck. I'll throw it at it. You know, if you don't, okay, fine. You know, 
probably don't read me anyway, but uh, everybody got a book, and I think, hey, price of a beer, it's not even price of a beer these days. Yeah. You know, it keeps us going, and I keep the message out, and there's still a ton of stuff I ain't telling anybody yet, but I'm doing this new escalator version of what to look for next. Everybody looking for EMP to hit, and I'm like, no, this is the other stuff that's happening, they should be following, and they can do it from their books. The only way you can do that, you get the $2 thing, and you'll notice most everything I'm saying is going to coincide a little bit with what's happening right now, and I'm speeding up because I think they're going to do as quick as they're doing. Yep. Well, neither did our military, but like I said, Pentagon's sitting around, what do you do? And they're trying to figure out how we go to war, how we do this and that, and then everybody's asking me, is this false flag? They're too much out there. They need to just, there's your basics. Right? Logically think it through. Yeah, what do we got today? What what happens now? Uh, yeah. That dollar, and what is this that extra can of tool you're going to buy? And I'm telling you, <laughs> give it to me, and I'll tell you something cooler to do with the same dollar, you know? Well, everyone's feeling the anxiety and feeling like something big's about to happen. And this kind of gives them, looks like, an overview of what the probabilities are. Well, I'll tell you what. When, it, when I hear something's going to happen, I'll tell everybody to go buy a painter's tarp at Walmart or something for a dollar. You know, have a painting this month and put it in your back pocket because at least you have a rain tarp walking down the street. And, and that's when I know the balloon's going up, best of my knowledge. And, I bet they don't have one in their back pocket today, and if they bought it on a whim and they had one, they'd be grinning while they're walking down the street doing the prepper's road bars, wouldn't they? Yep. <laughs> they damn it, that wrong was right. Got my horseshoe pack. <laughs> All right, back to it. Okay. Hmm, where am I? Destroy nine interconnection substations and a transformer manufacturer and the entire United States grid would be down for at least 18 months, probably longer, a government analysis obtained by the Wall Street Journal concluded in 2014. Guess where those big transformers of ours that take a year to build come from? That's right, South Korea. The government called this the nine substation problem. Yeah, the guy going to nuke us from North Korea, and they build the damn transformers in South Korea. He'll uh, probably hello, nuke them. why ain't anybody talking about that? I'm talking about it. Y'all know it? Now you know it. Go ahead. The government called this the nine substation problem. As the government study showed, there are approximately 55,000 electric substations, most of which have little security beyond fences, 30 of which are deemed critical. If just nine transformers of those 30 were messed with, it would be lights out for quite a while. Let's see, a conventional attack with a mortar, a bazooka, a sniper rifle, and explosives, you name it, all of which can all be had on the black market, but you don't have to get even that conventional weapon sophisticated or costly to turn the lights out on the heartland for a long time. A Pacific Gas and Electric pg and &E, power substation was hit with gunfire not <coughs> long ago, which was deemed an act of vandalism. pg and &E spokesman Jason King said the gunshots caused cooling oil to leak from the substation. Little did they know, or want to admit to, that this was actually a trial run by a terrorist group using just a hunting rifle. Perhaps most disturbingly, the California substation attack, in which snipers with AK-47s destroyed 17 transformers, demonstrates that it does not require sophistication to do a significant damage to the U.S. grid, according to FERC. Then there are rural electric cooperatives to be concerned with. There are roughly 1,000 companies responsible for distributing power to tens of millions of Americans. Although these grids aren't the biggest targets, they have been called one of the biggest risks based on their relatively limited security measures. A small team of North Korean commandos could take over one within minutes. You could probably pay the MS-13 street gang or a bunch of meth heads to do it, or run interference for a few operatives to do it without much cash or problem. North Korea already had its elite teams of commandos poised on the border of South America, as well as infiltrating America, that were already known of. The same with the Iranians, who had supposedly massed at least 50,000 soldiers in South America. And if you think about it, getting a bunch of suicidal jihads together to attack the infidel ain't that hard to do. 
Both Iran and Korea could pay to have it done by any number of groups and give them state-sponsored aid to help complete their missions. It wasn't us they could deny. It was those crazy Al-Qaeda boys the U.S. already had trouble with. Or pe perhaps it was them ISIS folks you've been warring with, etc. Hey, America, you lift these sanctions off us or we're going to do this or that. Same old BS for another day. The evil alliance would have no trouble wearing America's resolve down further and accomplish the mission to make its citizens question their government and riot and protest to cause more havoc was one of the aims. Amory Lovins, chairman of the Rocky Mountain Institute, wrote in his 1982 book, Brittle Power, that a few people could probably black out most of the country. The book surprised and rightly concerned people when it came out by citing frequent instances of grid terrorism throughout the 1970s, such as transformer shootings and substation bombings. This was one of Communist Kim's favorite books, and it sat on his desk in the war room bunker far underground. He used it like a boardroom map, pointing here and there to targets he wanted his generals to arrange to take out. Chapter Milestones on the Road to Armageddon Standing outside the main office of a power company in California, a hacker the North Koreans had employed, known as Drago, pulls an employee's electronic badge out of his pocket and waves it at an outside sensor. The door unlocks, even though it's a fake card made with data stolen earlier that day. Once Drago gets inside the building, which oversees various sites and substations delivering power to around 150,000 customers, he is happy that no alarm sounds or security guards appear to stop him. Cameras silently watch the hacker as he heads toward a room where the servers are located, aka the treasure room, intent on taking over as many of the company's systems as he can. Drago stops and rifles through the desk of an information technology, IT, employee, looking for anything useful. He moves under the desk, looking for a suitable place to install custom hardware that will call back to him later over the internet. He then unlocks an iPad to look through a few confidential emails before moving on to a stack of notes on the desk. I see, said the blind man. You haven't they didn't get the latest Homeland Security warnings or the corporate memo on not leaving passwords laying around on sticky notes. I've got a root password here, he says, holding a yellow bit of paper with the word root and a weak five-character password. He's just uncovered the crown jewel in this little foray. This appeared to be a possibly a top administrator password that likely would give him unrestricted access to just about any computer on the network. It wasn't like he needed to ever worry about paying his power bill again. He had plenty of Bitcoin and a Swiss bank account full of cash that nice Korean guy had paid him for a little covert surveillance hacking. Later on, he needed to dig a little deeper into the network to figure out just how much he can do. I it's think they're crash Bitcoin. You think they're going to crash Bitcoin? Yeah. Cool. That'd be a good start Remember, for it. Guys, said, I don't want to get into it right now. You were asking me about putting a dollar on, and I said, if, to use that as an excuse to crash Bitcoin or take it over, we already went to war with Iran. If you get off the damn petrodollar, it's crazy, right? Yeah. We got an excuse to crash Bitcoin, smush everybody. It does. It don't exist to begin with, people. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I didn't want to get into it with you the other day. That's most of the banking system. For God's sake, they sell debt. Yeah, I mean, debt. you can make a hell of a lot of money, but right at the moment, it scares me. And, you know, I don't talk about what I know much, but I'm like, okay, here's a big thing that I see. And if no nation has their own Bitcoin, all nations will crash Bitcoin. Hmm. Yep. That'd be a big one. That's what I see. I don't know. But when you ask me, I'm like, no, sweetie, I'd rather have a can of beans. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Not right now. I mean, might be wrong. You might give a zillion dollars and I need a can of beans by a bean factory. But I'm like, right now, I know we got the perfect excuse to do it. And then everybody that's a terrorist in the world is getting their money in Bitcoin. And drug dealers do Bitcoin. They're going to crash Bitcoin. I've watched a lot of your instincts become true. Yeah. So that's why I would guess them. Yep. That sounds like a good one. It just me assume. 
See, that's why they won't get our two dollar thing because they get wrong business, you know. Let's stay up to date on everything. Later on, he needed to dig a little deeper into the network to figure out just how much he can do. It's highly likely his find could result in the theft of corporate proprietary information on the company, leaks of private co customer details like SSNs, home addresses, or even access to critical systems that could take electricity offline. But he didn't care. He quietly slipped out of the building the same way he came in and went home and waited for the next power company operator to log on. Over in Washington, D.C., Another hired hacker carefully gained access to the district's welfare and food stamp distribution computers before heading to Mexico to enjoy her ill-gotten gains. Who cares if someone wants to change, charge the system for some more free food and money? Everyone that's on it will still get it, or so she thought. The skillet was hot, now it was time to turn up the heat and get some smoke going. Terrorists set wildfires in the West were already creating havoc. They had figured out long ago about using fire as a tactical weapon of war. This was perhaps the simplest form of economic warfare they could think of by causing wild land arson. Yeah, more wildfires than we've ever had so far. Yep, all over. This tactic allowed them to inflict significant damage with very little investment or risk. Fire is an extremely high leverage weapon of mass effect. The economic, economic damage caused by setting fires in U.S. forests and grasslands was significant, as well as tied up many resources. Dr. Rachel Ehrenfeld of the New York-based American Center for Democracy's Economic Warfare Institute had previously warned that, a la that last a few months ago, Al-Qaeda's English-language online magazine, Inspire, published an article called It is of your freedom to ignite a firebomb, which featured instructions on how to build an incendiary bomb to light forests on fire. A few months later, Russia's security ch FSB chief, Alexander Bortnikov warned Al-Qaeda was complicit in recent foreign fires in Europe as part of the terrorist strategy of a thousand cuts. All these things were but distractions, however, as the enemies of the United States and its allies networked its minions to create hell on Earth. The tempest of World War III loomed on the horizon, most people thought, thinking of it as a nuclear exchange as the war drums beat louder to end these blatant attacks, but saner heads tried to prevail. Neither North Korea nor Iran had demonstrated or tested a full-blown nuclear device above ground that had damaged anyone as of yet. Israel was on a hair trigger and threatened to take care of it, Iran itself if the U.S. didn't hurry and step up to the plate. They were already bombing the hell out of the various terrorist factions threatening its borders as the world began to get even crazier. America's borders were under siege as numerous Mexican gangs linked to the drug cartels smuggled in so-called refugees or foreign freedom fighters they didn't care which and didn't mind selling them, or anybody else that wanted them, guns. The sun was entering solar minimum, and it was throwing off unprecedented coronal mass ejections of enormous size. Volcanoes, earthquakes, and hurricanes plagued the world. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Various plagues and pestilences were occurring throughout the world as scientists struggled to combat them and find effective cures. A whole Pandora's box of woes had seemed to have been wildly let loose in the world. Weather wars seemed to be occurring as countless countries accused one another of this or that dastardly deed and tried geoengineering to either offset a wildfire by making rain or in the United States and China and Russia's case of causing earthquakes and other supposedly natural disasters. That Kim Jong-un was in back of a lot of this mayhem was a given. What to do about it was the problem. The president can order a nuclear strike in about the time it takes to write a tweet. He can easily turn that North Korean fat boy Kim into, into a tostito, but there were major potential repercussions from Russia and China to consider. They were not likely to be appreciative of the radioactive fallout that might come off such a strike and cross their borders. The president kind of felt like he was being pistol whipped by the North Korean atomic threat. Leveling the playing field is what Kim Jong-un had in his devious mind. The U.S. didn't want to fight him conventionally, he thought, and his threat of nuclear response, if attacked, held them at bay for now, as their country lost power and influence yeah, three daily. Warning here, right? Three minute warning on we're gonna be the end of what we're going to give them. They're going to have to give me two bucks on this one. Okay. I'm sorry I say it that way, but you know. Yeah, well, you know me. I always it's get into the story so much. It's this, this is a good story, but, you know, uh, this is, 
you just reading it. Now you got to edit the thing after. You're going to have to go in. I said, we have to, we're supposed to, we, you're reading during our 15 minutes that we're going to do, right? Which yeah. I'm enjoying it too. I forgot where it was at, right? <laughs> but, uh, you go back in there. And I don't put the word dad or I don't spell friend right or all the stuff I do. This is my, and fix it up. But anyway, I'm, I'm telling just so far, did you just see me just have one guy walk in here? And one woman shut off everything. All the food stamps in one day give us that problem with the people. Yeah. You know, do that and shut down a little town over here. I just got a few people wandering around. We got people coming back and forth across the doors already. It's easy to mess with the United States. Nobody think about, you know, back in the day, oh, communism in my backyard. You gonna have, you know. Well, if anyone's really been watching, they've been setting this up for a long time, mm. and they're darn near completion. But did that scare what I come up with? Scare the hell out of you, and you don't have to fire a shot, and we ain't gonna smoke because everybody just, you know. Anytime I write anything about their missiles, say, "Oh, we're just smoking." No, he gets to do what we want because even though we know we do, we're scared he's gonna escalate the nuclear thing. Yeah. And that's what it means to do. See, I'm actually in his head, and I know he just wants to be his little hermit kingdom. He don't want to end up like Saddam. Yeah. And he's like, ah, I want the weapon that thing. But meantime, he's also going, I get you anyway. And if I can do it sitting in my prepper shack, I assure you he can do it. Yeah. And so... Everybody said, what are you missing? That's what I mean. It's, it's fixed and enjoy it while it is. Right. <sighs> Scary times. In a war of attrition, both sides have the same approximate strength, and each attempts to force the other to surrender by wearing the other down. The prevailing side simply outlasts the other, forcing continuous losses of people, equipment, weapons, or food. Tomorrow, Kim Jong-un would turn off half of America's lights and cut off millions on welfare and food stamps. By the time the stupid Americans figured out who was truly at fault, it would be too late to care about him. Millions of starving citizens would take to the streets angrily in a few days, rioting, Kim hoped, and this outpouring of America's ghettos would tie up the military and police take down America from within by smartly using its own people to cause even more societal breakdown, vandalism, arson, and violence. That was the plan. Of course he wasn't done playing the game yet, neither was Iran. Next week or next month they would cause the rest of the electrical grid to go down in Europe and the US. Kim Jong-un picked up his favorite book and reread one highlight quote again for the umpteenth time. Destroy nine interconnection substations and a transformer manufacturer and the entire United States grid would be down for at least 18 months, probably longer, and called for his aide to take a memo. Where was that book that said the American EMP Commission had predicted 90% of its population would be dead in one year after the electrical grid was taken down? Kim thought to himself. Ah, yes, here it is, he murmured. Director James Woolsey and EMP Commission Chairman Dr. Vincent Pry from the Task Force on National and Homeland Security, published an article on thehill.com where they argued that a nuclear EMP attack could wipe out 90% of the U.S. population. Woolsey and Pry cite the Congressional EMP Commissions, arguing a single warhead delivered by North Korean satellite could black out the national electric grid and other life-sustaining critical in infrastructures for over a year, killing 9 of 10 Americans by starvation and societal a collapse. The threat to America's electrical grid is much bigger than you can possibly imagine. Do some preparations. Wake up! <laughs>